An Iceland Air Boeing 757, carrying 82 passengers and crew, is on final approach to Oslo in Norway. Suddenly, the plane pitches down and begins diving straight to the ground. Pandemonium erupts on board as the engines roar and the passengers are lifted out of their seats. The pilots are panicking. They have no idea what is happening to their aircraft. Will they be able to pull it out of its terrifying plunge before time runs out? This is the story of Iceland Air Flight 315. On the morning of January 22nd, 2002, 75 passengers and 7 crew boarded an Iceland Air Boeing 757 at Reykjavik Airport in Iceland. They were bound for Oslo, the capital city of Norway, about two hours away. The flight should have been just like any other from the country's national airline. The two pilots were experienced, and there was nothing particularly odd about the route, the weather, or the aircraft. But while the aircraft and the weather did play a role in the events to follow, at bottom, this is not a story about either of them. Really, Iceland Air Flight 315 is a fascinating case study on human psychology and on how people make decisions under stress. It's a story about how minor inconveniences, disguised as blessings, can lead people down a path which they never intended to go down. The captain of this flight was 43 years old and had been flying for Iceland Air since 1986. In this time, he had built up just over 8,000 flying hours, many of which were on this aircraft, the Boeing 757. The first officer was less experienced. At 26 years old, he had been flying for Iceland Air for the previous three years, in which time he'd accumulated just under 2,500 flying hours. After this flight, serious questions would be raised about how these pilots worked together as the pressure mounted. We'll take a closer look at this as the flight progresses. The aircraft they were flying was a three-year-old Boeing 757. In 2002, this was still a relatively modern aircraft, with a high level of safety and redundancy in its onboard systems. Pilots especially loved the plane, as it was one of the most powerful passenger aircraft ever built. It was affectionately known by many as the Pocket Rocket, owing to the sheer level of performance that pilots could get out of its engines. But on this flight, the pilots will be helped on by more than just their engines. En route, a significant tailwind would shed minutes off their planned flight time. But as the crew neared Oslo, this would turn out not to be the blessing that it first appeared to be. At around 20 past 7 that morning, Flight 315 pushed back from the gate at Reykjavik and began taxiing out to the runway. The passengers settled in for the journey. They would be in Norway in just about two hours. At 25 to 8, the captain lined the aircraft up with the runway and pushed the powerful Rolls-Royce engines to take off thrust. Within seconds, the plane was rocketing skywards, leaving the cold climbs of Iceland behind for the cold climbs of Norway. En route, the flight progressed as normal. Passengers sitting by the windows got a stunning view of the sunrise as the plane cruised eastwards. The pilots too were treated to this view. However, they knew that the weather conditions would not be so nice as they neared Oslo. At 20 past 10 that morning, when the flight was 200 nautical miles from Oslo, the pilots listened in to the weather information at the airport. Runway 01 right was in use, the right-hand northerly runway. It was going to be a foggy approach and landing, typical for Oslo in the wintertime. There were scattered clouds as low as 200 feet above the ground and an overcast cloud ceiling at 500 feet. The visibility was just a thousand meters and, importantly, there was a tailwind of 20 knots or nearly 40 kilometers an hour, all the way down to just 200 feet above the runway. In other words, this approach would require the crew's full attention. They wouldn't be able to see the runway until the final seconds before landing. The pilots set up their instruments and navigation aids, and they carried out an approach briefing for a landing on runway 01 right at Oslo. At this point in the flight, the pilots were calm and in control. They were still a few minutes from beginning the descent, and they were getting the aircraft set up nice and early so that their workload would not be too heavy as they neared the airport. Ten minutes later, 
air traffic control cleared them to fly one of the standard arrivals into the airport. The pilots programmed this into their flight management computer and began descending. As they descended, the crew were aware that a tailwind had been forecast for the majority of their approach. From a passenger's point of view, it's almost always a positive thing when pilots mention a tailwind. It means that they'll be arriving ahead of schedule. But the reality is that while a tailwind is enormously helpful en route, it can become a problem as the plane nears the airport. The descent and approach is a busy time for pilots. A lot has to be accomplished to set the aircraft up for a successful landing, especially in poor visibility. A tailwind means that the plane will approach the airport faster than usual. This means that all of the tasks which the pilots have to do before landing, including the very act of descending, are now compressed into a much smaller amount of time. And for the pilots of Flight 315, the tailwinds were much stronger than forecast. They were as high as 75 knots, or about 140 km per hour. While the pilots were aware of the tailwind initially, the events which followed would soon push this awareness out of their minds. As they descended, the pilots received a shortcut from air traffic control. They were cleared directly to one of the waypoints further along their arrival route. Again, shortcuts are often thought of as a good thing by pilots and passengers alike. But unbeknownst to the crew of Flight 315, this shortcut would end up having a profound effect on their ability to get the aircraft down safely. Then, Air Traffic Control radioed the pilots with some bad news. The runway they were due to land on was covered in snow. Snow trucks had been dispatched to clear it, but they wouldn't be finished by the time Flight 315 reached the runway. So, the controller told the pilots that they would now need to land on the parallel runway, runway 01 left. This last minute change of plans increased the workload for the already busy pilots. They had to set up their flight management computer for the arrival to runway 01 left, tune in the ILS frequency for the new runway, and then brief the approach together. This whole time, the plane was being carried along in a current of air much stronger than that which had been forecast. In the rush to set the aircraft up for its new approach, the pilots didn't notice how strong this tailwind had gotten. This, combined with the shortcuts the pilots had received earlier, had meant that they were now getting high on their descent profile. For the pilots of Flight 315, the situation looked something like this. At the start of the descent, they were on profile. Not too high, and not too low. However, there was a tailwind, which effectively shortened their route to the runway, making their ideal descent profile steeper. This meant that if they descended at their usual rate, they wouldn't make it down to the runway in time. So, to match the steepness of their new descent profile, the pilots would have to descend at a faster rate. And initially, they did this. But as they neared the airport, they received yet another shortcut, which further reduced the distance between them and the airport. Now, their ideal descent profile had gotten even steeper. It was basically inevitable. Flight 315 began to drift above the descent profile. But here's the interesting thing about this flight, and it's the key to the events which followed. No plane has ever crashed from getting too high on its descent profile. It's the ground that pilots have to worry about, not the air. The solution to the crew's predicament couldn't have been more straightforward. All they had to do was to tell the controller that they needed a few extra miles to lose altitude. But under the self-imposed pressure to make the runway, something known in aviation as get their itis, the pilots never did this. They sped on towards Oslo, too high and too fast. To the passengers in the back of the aircraft, this seemed like any other descent. But in the cockpit, the pressure was on. The captain extended the speed brakes in an attempt to make the plane descend faster. But their effect was limited. The plane was still too high. In moments like this, all it would have taken to fix the situation was for one pilot to take a step back, analyse the situation, and tell the other pilot that there was a much better option available to them. That was to simply extend their path to the runway by a few miles. This kind of cooperation is known as crew resource management, and it saved thousands of lives on passenger aircraft since being introduced to pilot training in the 1980s and 1990s. But the very pressure the pilots had put themselves under 
led to a breakdown in this vital safeguard. It was a vicious cycle. Pressure to get to the airport quickly caused a breakdown in crew resource management, and this breakdown in crew resource management created more pressure, which led to worse crew resource management, and so on. Each pilot was now going about his tasks in his own world. They were no longer working as a team. In a few short minutes, this lack of teamwork would have dire consequences, threatening the lives of everyone on board. At a quarter to 11 that morning, air traffic control cleared Flight 315 to intercept the ILS for runway 01 left. ILS stands for Instrument Landing System, and it's what pilots use to navigate accurately towards the runway in low visibility. The ILS consists of two beams, which are shot out from the surface of the runway, creating a virtual path for planes to follow. One of these beams is the vertical component, called the glide slope, and the other is the horizontal component, called the localizer. On the Boeing 757, each of these is represented by purple symbols on the pilot's attitude direction indicator here. This purple symbol represents the glide slope, and this rectangle represents the plane. Right now, the plane is above the glide slope. Similarly, this purple symbol is the localizer, and right now it's showing that the plane here is to the left of it. By pitching the plane up and down, and turning it left and right, the captain would be able to keep the purple ILS symbols lined up with the aircraft. By doing this all the way down to the ground, he would burst out of the clouds at 200 feet, perfectly lined up with the runway. But this is where the pressure the pilots had put themselves under earlier really started to take its toll. They were still high on the descent profile, and they were much faster than normal due to the massive tailwind. This meant that when the plane intercepted the localizer, the autopilot wasn't able to turn quickly enough to line up with the runway. As a result, the aircraft overshot the centerline, and had to turn back towards it and re-intercept it from the opposite side. Finally, the plane was lined up with the runway, and the controller cleared the flight down to 2500 feet. The pilots continued descending, and lowered the landing gear. But they were still high. The tailwind was pushing them towards the runway so fast that the autopilot was struggling to get the plane down onto the glide slope. At this point, you might be thinking that it would have been wise for the pilots to abort the approach and land in the opposite direction. After all, planes are supposed to land into the wind. But the Earth's atmosphere is peculiar in this way, in that the wind varies by altitude. Flight 315 was at about 3000 feet, where there was a 45 knot tailwind. But on the runway, there was a light headwind. And when it comes to takeoff and landing, the only wind that matters is the wind on the runway. So the pilots continued their approach. But now, the captain was beginning to doubt the autopilot's ability to get the plane down onto the glide slope. It just wasn't being aggressive enough. So he disengaged it and began flying the plane manually. He pushed the nose down, trying to get his aircraft level with the purple glide slope symbol, which remained obstinately beneath him. He was wrestling the aircraft down, his left hand on the control column and his right hand on the throttles. His full concentration was on getting the aircraft onto the glide slope. But then, something strange happened. Something which would throw the captain off balance for the rest of the flight. The symbols representing the ILS on the captain's display simply vanished. The captain now had no idea where he was in relation to the runway. As a precaution, he pulled up slightly on his control column, not wanting to descend too much this close to the ground. But seconds later, the symbols reappeared. The plane was still high, but the captain pressed on, pushing the nose back down in an attempt to do what's known as a slam dunk approach, which is to intercept the glide slope from above. This went on for a few seconds before again the captain's ILS symbols disappeared. He told the first officer, but the first officer reported that his instruments were working normally. At this point, it would have been a good idea for the captain to hand over control to the first officer, as his instruments appeared to be reliable. But instead, he continued. The aircraft was now just over a minute from landing. The ILS indications again reappeared, but the plane was still high and fast. As it descended below 1,000 feet, neither pilot said a word. 
Standard procedure dictated that at this altitude, the pilot not flying, in this case the first officer, should state whether the aircraft is stabilised on the approach. That is, whether it is fully on the ILS and set up for landing. If the aircraft is not stabilised on the approach by 1000 feet, the pilots have to abort the approach. But cooperation between the two pilots had broken down during their rush descent, and the first officer never made this announcement. The plane was high and fast, the flaps were still not set for landing, and the landing checklist had not been carried out. This was the definition of an unstabilised approach, and it was about to have serious consequences for everybody on board. The pilots pressed on, but just 600 feet above the ground, the captain had had enough. He still couldn't get the plane onto the glide slope. He announced that he was going around. He pulled the nose of the plane up and pushed the go-around switches on the throttles. The engine spooled up and the plane began to climb. The first officer raised the gear, and the captain continued pitching the nose up until it was 20 degrees above the horizon. So far, this go-around was normal, but now the pilot's haphazard approach would come back to bite them in a terrifying way. Because they had never completed the before landing checklist, they had never set the missed approach altitude on the autopilot. This meant that rather than having 4,000 feet set, they had 2,500 feet set, which was the last altitude provided to them by the controller. As they were in a rapid climb, they quickly blew past this altitude, and when they did, the autopilot reduced the thrust output of the engines. Now, rather than providing go-around thrust, which was needed for the plane's climb, it was aiming for the speed the pilots had previously selected for their approach, which was just 150 knots. The speed was rapidly decreasing. If the captain didn't do something, the plane would stall and drop from the sky. Seeing this, he quickly pushed the nose of the plane down to level it off. This sudden dramatic movement nearly lifted everyone on board out of their seats. But inexplicably, rather than stopping once he had leveled the plane, the captain continued pushing the nose down. One passenger, who had not been wearing his seatbelt, was lifted up out of his seat as the plane entered near weightlessness. Passengers who were strapped in had their glasses and mobile phones lifted out of their shirt pockets. Newspapers and magazines were thrown out of their racks as the plane dipped, and water inside the toilets splashed up into the bathroom ceiling. In the cockpit, charts and briefcases became airborne. The aircraft's nose was now pointed more than 40 degrees below the horizon. The plane was building up tremendous speed, its engines roaring as it powered towards the ground. The passengers screamed in horror. The captain was completely disoriented. Even though his instruments were telling him exactly what was happening, he couldn't quite make sense of them. The automated voice of the aircraft boomed in the cockpit. Terrain. Terrain. Too low. Terrain. If neither pilot did something, their aircraft, travelling at over 450 km per hour, would careen into the ground in a matter of seconds. The first officer shouted, What are you doing? Pull up! Pull up! Both pilots yanked back hard in their control columns in a desperate bid to pull the aircraft out of its terrifying dive. The plane groaned under the g-forces, straining as it pulled out of its rapid descent. Everyone on board was pushed into their seats with a force of 3.5 g's. This is so strong that anybody who normally weighs 80 kilograms would feel themselves to be 280 kilograms. Both pilots too were being pushed into their seats by the incredible g-forces, as they pulled with all of their might on the controls. Just over 300 feet from impact, the plane's dive finally bottomed out, and it began climbing. But this was no ordinary climb. With the pilots still reeling from the dive, and still struggling to catch up with their aircraft, they allowed the pitch of the plane to reach a full 40 degrees nose up. The auto throttle slammed the thrust levers fully forwards, straining to maintain airspeed during the rapid climb. Within seconds, the plane had rocketed up to 3,000 feet, where the captain finally managed to stabilise it. But he was still shaken. His aircraft had gotten out ahead of him like a wild horse. The captain coaxed the aircraft up to 4,000 feet and levelled off. Back in the cabin, the passengers were in shock. Some were crying, and others were praying. Nobody had any idea what had just happened. The cockpit, like the passenger cabin, was a mess, with stray papers, charts, and manuals scattered everywhere. For the pilots, 
there was little time to process what had happened, or why. The first officer informed air traffic control that they were carrying out a missed approach, but told them nothing of the extreme manoeuvre which had just occurred, or how close they had come to crashing. The controller gave the pilots vectors back for another approach. Meanwhile, the captain gave a short announcement to the passengers, telling them that the approach had not been successful, and that they were going back to land within 10 minutes. The pilots circled around, and once again lined up with the runway. This time, their approach was stabilised. They were on the glide slope, and everything appeared to have returned to normal. But then, once again, the captain's ILS readings disappeared from his instruments. He wasn't taking any chances this time. He immediately handed over control to the first officer, who guided the aircraft down to the runway. Everyone on board was in shock, the pilots included. The manoeuvre had been so violent that many passengers near the front of the aircraft would later find their mobile phones and reading glasses at the back of the plane. Strangely, the pilots didn't provide any debriefing to the passengers about what had just occurred. The passengers simply disembarked once the plane had parked up at the gate. The pilots cleaned up the cockpit and then spoke to the flight attendants, explaining what had happened. But they still couldn't determine what had caused the violent manoeuvre to begin with. And when investigators caught wind of the incident and began probing into this strange series of events, they couldn't make head nor tails of it either. Why on earth would an experienced pilot voluntarily push the nose of his plane so far down during a go-round? One possible explanation for the captain's actions is a powerful psychological phenomenon known as the somatographic illusion. This illusion occurs because the brain is unable to tell the difference between acceleration and the body being oriented up. You can think of it this way. When you accelerate in a car, you get pushed back into your seat but you can also get pushed back into your seat when you go uphill. It's an almost identical sensation. In a car, it's easy to tell which one is happening, because you can see out the window. But in a plane, in the clouds, the only way you can tell whether you're accelerating or climbing is by checking your instruments, in particular, the attitude direction indicator. So, we might be able to answer the question of why the captain pushed the nose down by finding out what the plane was doing just before he did. As it turns out, he pushed the nose down just after levelling off the plane, when it began to accelerate. In the clouds, the captain may have misinterpreted this acceleration as the plane beginning to pitch up, in response to which he pushed the nose down. He was so disoriented from the strong g-forces, and from how quickly everything had happened, that he couldn't make sense of what his instruments were telling him which was that he was now diving straight for the ground. It has never been determined whether the somatographic illusion caused the captain to act in this way, but it would be far from the first time this effect has caused a pilot to do something like this. This phenomenon has been responsible for hundreds of passenger fatalities over the years. In this case, the first officer saved the day at the last moment, but the truth is that it should never have gotten to this point in the first place. All of this was downstream of some poor decisions made by the crew earlier on in the flight, which happened because of a total breakdown in crew resource management. What's frightening about this incident is how quickly and easily it developed, and therefore, how likely it was to happen again. All that had occurred was that a qualified crew had made some very human mistakes, which put them in a situation where they were vulnerable to making even more mistakes. With this in mind, Investigators recommended that the aviation community, as well as Iceland Air itself, should review the procedures for discontinued approaches. It also recommended that the Civil Aviation Authority of Norway should consider the effect of air traffic control shortening approaches in low visibility conditions, especially for airline crew with possible limited experience of Oslo. On that morning in January 2002, Flight 315 came way too close to crashing. But the lessons learned from this near catastrophe about crew resource management and approach planning have been incorporated into pilot training, making the sky that much safer. If you found this video interesting, 
You can also join the Patreon to support the channel and get early access to new videos. I'm really grateful for the support that the Patreons provide because they make it possible for my team and I to continue putting in the work to research and produce these videos. So check out these links on screen and I'll see you soon for the next episode.